This is Tabletop Deathmatch, a competition to find the next great tabletop game. It was entertaining. I don't think I would buy this game. Everything sort of flowed logically. Game designers from all over the country sent their prototypes to us at Cards Against Humanity. We picked eight finalists, and now we're bringing them to Gen Con, the biggest tabletop gaming convention in the world, where they're going to pitch their prototypes to our panel of industry-leading judges. One game will win a first printing paid for by Cards Against Humanity and be crowned the winner of Tabletop Deathmatch. Tabletop Deathmatch is an independent game design contest and now web series also that Cards Against Humanity put together because we want to, uh, I don't know, let me start over, this is terrible. Uh, Tabletop Deathmatch, uh, who knows? I hate this, this is the worst. They choose eight independent games, send them to judges, and those games, uh, uh, um. Tabletop Deathmatch is a bloody gladiatorial arena. Well, games are important to me personally, firstly, because I made one and that's my job. Scratch that, I don't want to see anything. <laughs> if I can also give a real answer. Okay. <laughs> Did that make any sense? Mm -hmm. That was a lot of words. Yes. I'll, just, I'll be very concise for Graham. I'm gonna answer everything with a yes or a no. Please don't do that. Yes. My favorite games are games that are really quick to play and easy to learn because I have almost no attention span. We value a really good idea. Stop making space games that are just mining in space. Based on what we learned from last year, we're going to spend more time getting to actually play the wonderful games at Tabletop Deathmatch and a little more time to get to know the creators and talk to them. Everyone is pretty nice. <laughs> that seems like a really boring reality show thing. This game is called Aguirre. Egyar? <laughs> A-G-U-I-R-R-E. It is a historical game. It is an historical game where players must gain influence in a variety of ways in an effort to survive Mad Aguirre's growing paranoia. Busted. Hello, my name is Bryce Journey. I live here in Omaha, Nebraska. I teach writing at Iowa Western Community College. In my spare time when I'm not teaching, I'm also a very minor poet, essayist, and short story writer. This last summer I designed a board game, Aguirre, because having a new baby wasn't stressful enough. Aguirre is one of the great villains of South American history. In 1560, he had took over the last of the major Spanish expeditions to find El Dorado by assassinating the conquistador Ursua, who was in charge of that expedition. Over the course of the next several months, the expedition faced challenges in many forms before ultimately Aguirre was besieged at a Spanish fort and executed by his own men, represented as only a handful of survivors of the ill-fated expedition. Aguirre is different from other Euro-style board games in that Aguirre is both fast-paced and thematic. These are a couple of complaints that many Euro games have, and Aguirre solves these problems by averaging 15 minutes per player and being thematic as the players are immersed in the history behind the game. Not too long ago, I was reading the autobiography of my favorite science fiction writer, Robert Silverberg. In this book, he describes his adventures writing nonfiction, including a giant 500-page tome describing the various Spanish expeditions to find El Dorado. Recently, at a library book sale, I came across that book, the longest chapter of which describes the misadventures of the tyrant Aguirre. Here is a ruthless, uh, maniacal madman who's been completely lost to history. I brainstormed different mechanics and ways to incorporate this personality as the central point of a board game. I've been working on Aguirre for about a year now, and I've approached the process of game design as I approach writing. Brainstorming, outlining, drafting, and revision. And the next step was actually writing the rule document. This is something that a lot of board games today, I think, neglect. And it was only after I had that in place that I actually made the game in the prototype stage, assembling the different pieces and components and starting playtesting. This is the first board game that I've designed, and even though after many years of playing board games myself, I really had no idea how to assemble a prototype. Uh, I designed all the cards on Microsoft Word, which is probably not the best program to use for this sort of thing, but it, as a writer, it's what I was most comfortable with. 
I'm very excited to be working with my artist Mackenzie Schubert who did the art on Penny Press. He's got a completely new art style that's going to look really amazing with the queer and I'm excited to see it. Uh, I think of the two physicians, uh, I, I think I do like the one holding the leg better. That would right. be accurate uh, surgery of the time, just hacking off limbs, that's, uh, that's perfect. Carrying them around. Cool. <laughs> uh, I especially like uh, Guzman here, he kind of looks like a gullible sort of person who would be overthrown without any difficulty. Maybe I'll go a little more bend in that sword. <laughs> I think I'm going to try and tweak the, uh, the, like the blocks are all there, or like the building blocks of the characters, but kind of try and tweak the pose just a little bit as I go and refine. I was really excited when I read the email announcing that I was a finalist in Tabletop Deathmatch. My wife was even more excited though. Her eyes got really wide and, and uh, she started swearing a little bit. She knew it was a good game, but I don't think either one of us expected it to really stand out or shine above 350 other submissions. And when it did, uh, we knew we had something really special. Omaha is not known as a big board game uh, mecca of the world, but I think we've got a lot of creative talent, both with uh, games like Discount Salmon and some recent Kickstarters like Super Tooth. I think Omaha's got a lot to offer to the board game design community. Sorry, you finalists this year? Yeah. yeah. Yep. How's, how's it going? Where's your stress level? Uh, I'm, feeling really, I'm feeling really good, actually. Yeah. All right, look at that stuffed box, because there's so much stuff in there. This was the most expensive part of the game, getting these uh, specialized coins from Game Crafter. This is what's going to make a Gwir stand out among all the games, because this is a very nice, professional rule book. We did so much work on the last day before the deadline to get all the different files submitted to Game Crafter. And I was, I was so surprised when they emailed me back the very next day saying that the entire thing had been printed already. Because I've got a lot of pieces in this game. This is a, there's a lot going on in it. Uh, and it's fantastic. They did an excellent job. I am thrilled at how this turned out. I submitted my game with no art whatsoever. Uh, so <laughs> it's come a long way. My name is Bryce. Thank you for being part of the Gwir demo right here. To start a Gwir, players choose which of the ill-fated expedition's personalities they would like to assist them for the round. This is called the influence phase. Each personality provides a different benefit to the player, covering everything from granting various amounts of extra gold and influence points to helping players improve their ability to overcome different types of challenges. Once each player has chosen a personality for the round, the supply phase begins. Each player has the option to purchase one of the currently available supply cards to assist them during the journey, if they can afford them. Supply cards help players overcome different types of challenges, awarding the player that accumulates the most of each type of additional influence points at game's end. After the supply phase, the challenge phase begins. There are five types of challenges for players to overcome. Navigation, Morale, Privation, Health, and Native. During this phase, the top card in the Challenge card deck is revealed, displaying a unique combination of two of the five types of challenges. Each player must then attempt to overcome one of those challenges using a combination of their abilities, previously purchased supply items, gold, and their current challenge level. If a player is able to overcome either of the challenges, they gain a corresponding challenge token and advance along the challenge's pass track on their camp board. If a player is unable to pass either challenge, they must advance along their camp damage track instead. Each space advanced along either track represents influence points, positive on the challenge's pass track and negative on the camp damage track. When players accumulate a pair of the same type of challenge token, they gain a dramatic game-changing reward corresponding to the type of pair they accumulated. The final phase of the round is the Paranoia phase. Each personality influenced that round and the currently most influential unchosen personality are gathered up and shuffled. Then one is randomly selected to be executed by a Gwir. That personality is removed for the rest of the game and can no longer be influenced. In addition, the player who had influenced that personality must also advance one space along their camp damage track. 
The game lasts 10 rounds, and at the end, the player who has amassed the most influence points emerges as the lone survivor of the ill-fated expedition and the winner of the game. The year is 1560. The new Viceroy Peru, the Marquis of Canet, Don Andreas Hurtado de Mendoza, finds the Spanish colonies in tumult and disorder and infested with the scum of the earth. Anxious to rid himself of these undesirables, Mendoza charges the famous conquistador and explorer Pedro de Ursura to lead an expedition composed of these men to locate and subjugate the mythical city of El Dorado. I really liked the theme of a queer, and I love that it started off with a story, uh, and I was part of that story as a player. Uh, number one, number five, number four, number three, number two. So you get to pick which person you'd like to influence first. What we'll do for that is this extra token you have, just put it on top of that guy. Nobody else can take him now. I'll go for the soldier. All right. Uh, so we'll award uh, these immediate benefits here. Two gold for you. You get a point. Yellow gets five more gold. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, he's a popular guy, but that just means he might be assassinated sooner than anybody else. I thought the assassination was very fun. I thought it would be less interesting to have your choices taken away, but it actually made me feel a sense of tension because I was concerned that the person I had influenced would get assassinated. And it really bought me into the game and made me interested and kept my attention because I was like, what's going to happen? Everybody else slides up. And player number one, you get to choose what you purchase first. So let's go over these cards real quick. Advanced navigation level by one for a cost of two. Advance health by one for a cost of one. The blanket, discard the blanket in any health card, any red card, for four influence points any time during the game. I really enjoyed the colors in Aguirre. Uh, it popped compared to a lot of the other games with that sort of theme on the market. Generally, it's a dark theme, so you're gonna get a lot of dark colors, and it's gonna look like a lot of other things out there. If I was walking around uh, Gen Con in general, that would definitely stand out amongst a lot of the other games, and I think that helps it a lot. So the way I'm looking at it, the herbs seem like That's it's a deal. single point, yeah. Uh, one of the things I really liked about Aguirre was the strategy. As I was playing, I started realizing, oh, I want to get the most of a particular supply type, or it helps me to max out you know, a particular um, path. And it was sort of, I started seeing, oh, these are these different things I can do. You know, there's a reason to pick this character over that character, and it was very interesting. So, as a porter, I can um, purchase any leftover cards. Right, in this case uh, there's only one, but you can also purchase the, any one card in the, disc, in the discard pile. I think Aguirre had some great mechanics, but it had too many of them, and I would really like to see him refine it a little bit, so that uh, you can have a, a good, quicker um, play experience. And now we face our first challenge. So our primary challenge is morale, our secondary challenge is privation. So number one right here, uh, you have uh, one morale, you have one privation, you don't have any modifiers for any of those types of challenges, so you can spend four gold to pass the primary, three gold to pass the secondary, or you can voluntarily not pass either one, which I do not recommend. Uh, a lot of times with Euros, it's, it's hard to not have somebody sit there on their turn and somebody fiddle around on their phone. Uh, there are a lot of small choices that were important, so it was good. Everybody was pretty much paying attention the entire time. It was hard to get pulled away from the game, which I find really valuable. All right, so I have two in morale, uh -huh. and I have this guy who gives right. me plus you one. You picked the right one, good job. So you only need to spend one gold in order to pass the primary challenge, which is an excellent deal. I will do that. So you get to advance twice on uh, that track, yep, and take a morale token. All right, now we do the uh, paranoia phase, so I will take everybody's character together with this unfortunate guy, because paranoia strikes in places where it does not deserve. Playing Aguirre was interesting. It kind of felt like the reverse of a lot of the uh, expanding complication Euro games, where you start with a lot of options. As the game goes on, uh, your choices get narrower and narrower, which I think fits with the theme. And I like to let the first player pick who dies. That way, if we don't like who you chose, we can all we know who to. Look at that, the sailor. All right, that's the one that nobody picked. All right. So that guy is dead. Nobody advances the camp damage. These guys go back to the end. The theme is fantastic. I love the any story where everyone is ultimately going to die in the end, and you're just going to whittle them down to get there. And our challenge this turn, 
primary navigation. Uh, <laughs> health, very good. Uh, pilot, uh, yes, you picked the right one that time. Yay. Yay, us. And the missionary always said, you, right, you guys did uh, You guys did good. Uh, I think the judges will think that it's very well designed. And my main concern is, is it too cumbersome in the number of pieces and such for the complexity of the game? Uh, so the last turn of the game, nobody is assassinated. So we'll pretend that since this right, is the last right. turn, we won't do an assassination mm -hmm. the last turn. Safe, so we'll go finally. right to end of game score. Scoring. Each of your unspent tokens, you get one point for. Trade those in for a point each, so that's uh, uh, the challenge tokens. I think the judges will be concerned that the item cards that you buy have different effects. Some of them give you points right away, some of them only give you points at the end, and it's not clear how you use those cards. And that is the final score. Next time, Red! Next time! Victory! If we played a full game, uh, the odds would tend to dictate everybody would be assassinated at least once, probably a couple of times. Or every uh, time. So you were probably all done being assassinated. I bet, I bet that's what Aguirre told all of his friends. You're probably yeah. done being assassinated. Without actually pricing it, I, I honestly don't know. There were lots of bits and pieces of Aguirre that I really liked. I just don't like it enough. I appreciate it when a game kind of walks me along. So conflicted about this game right now.